Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today in this policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center in the framework of the election monitor series. Uh, this is an EPC flagship initiative that monitors national elections taking place across Europe and their domestic implications and also implications for the EU. My name is Marta Muchnik and I'm a policy analyst here at the European Politics and Institutions Program of the EPC. Today, we plan to zoom in and discuss the general results of the parliamentary elections uh, that took place in Greece just two days ago on June 25th. After a first election held on May 21st that failed to secure an outright majority for the incumbent center-right New Democracy Party led by Kyriakos Mitsotakis, a second snap election took place on June 25th, just two days ago, as I mentioned. And this second round saw the incumbent party winning by a landslide victory, giving it a comfortable majority to form a government for a second term. This election took place amid a heightened political climate with the economy and several concurrent scandals and also tragic events dominating recent headlines and also to some extent the election campaign. But what has actually been at the forefront of the Greek voters' concerns? What were the decisive factors driving the election results and also the election campaign? And what do they mean for the future of the Greek political landscape and its role uh, in the EU. Now, to help us make sense of the significance of these elections, both at the national and European levels, I'm joined today by two distinguished speakers, which I'm honored to introduce. Yanis Emanoulidis, Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Studies of the European Policy Center, and Eleni, Eleni Varviziotti, Financial Times correspondent in Athens. Welcome you both, and thank you so much for agreeing to speak at this event. Now, I will, now, I will, start, I will, first, I will first have a conversation, have a conversation with analysts, and then I will turn to the audience for questions and answers. Now, for all of those of you, all of, all of those who have been following and monitoring our events, you know the drill by now. You can pose your question in writing in the Q&A section of your screen, or at any time during the course of the event, or if you wish to speak directly and raise your questions directly to our speakers, which I really, really encourage you to do, please raise your hand in the little icon in the lower bottom of your screen and I will give you the floor directly. directly. And with that, uh, let's get started. Um, now, I would like to first begin by asking both our speakers uh, Yanis and Eleni to really share with us your reading of the significance of this outcome. And I will first start with, with Yanis. Uh, Yanis, is this uh, good news for Greece and the EU? Please, Yanis, go ahead. You're muted. <laughs> exactly, we have a bit of a technical issue, so we need to mute and unmute ourselves all the time. Um, let me start with a couple of introductory remarks to how I read um, these elections. I'm sure that we're going to Delve deeper. I think, first of all, um, if you take both elections together, the May and the June election, I think it has been a remarkable result. Uh, if you go back into May, um, there was not a lot of people who thought that the support for new democracy for the party of uh, Kiriakos Mitsotakis would be above 40%. Um, so that was at the time a surprise, and it was a surprise uh, which was confirmed, was confirmed in the June vote. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think that most people did not expect that the main opposition party series that would have that bad a result in May, which was not only confirmed, but it was even um, um, a worse result compared to May um, of the series of party, 20% in May, 17.8% uh, in, in June. So I think that's one of the first um, uh, things to mention. The second is this provides uh, the country with a stable and strong majority. Uh, but I don't think that will be that we're going to have four easy years ahead for the country. Um, I think that most Greeks wanted to have stability. They wanted to have, they felt that with um, uh, a government led by um, one party, not having a coalition party would provide a bigger a level of, of higher level of stability to the country. And as I said, a lot of Greeks wanted that. Uh, but still, I think the next four years will not be easy. 
Um, traditionally, second terms um, are never easy, uh, but also if you look into uh, what needs to be done at the national level with respect, for example, to health reform, education, uh, judicial system, which needs reform, I think that there are large packages of reforms which still um, need to be undertaken. Um, so this will not be um, easy years ahead. Uh, but having said that, if you look over the past four years, um, this government had to deal with a lot of different crises um, at different levels and and, uh, and and very different crises. Um, so the past four years haven't been um, easy either. Third point, and I think that is a, um, a worrisome um, a development is uh, and is the fact that around 30% of voters uh, voted for the extreme or radical right. Um, and uh, linked with the fact that we also had a low turnout, um, a very low turnout, historically low turnout. Um, I think that is um, something which should uh, make one feel worry in terms of um, what that means for the for the democratic political system in Greece in, in general. Um, but again, I think we're going to dig into deeper that into the discussion. And from an EU perspective, I think you will see a lot of continuity. Um, I think that um, there's a good chance that the country will stay on track when it comes to its economy, when it comes to fiscal stability. Um, but again, there are a lot of things that still need to be done, as I said earlier. And last but not least, from a geopolitical perspective, um, there's a question of how these um, election results, also paired with the fact that you had elections in Turkey, will have an effect on the geopolitical situation in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, especially the relations with, uh, with Turkey. Um, so I think that these elections, one, were a surprise. Um, they provide stability, but a lot still has to be done. Um, and from an EU perspective, um, I think we will see a lot of continuity, but there's also the question of how things will develop geopolitically um, the, in the region, which is of particular significance from a European, but also from a global perspective. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, a lot of ground to cover indeed, and indeed, we will delve into a lot of these issues uh, uh, in greater detail. Perhaps just one uh, follow-up question to what you've mentioned. I mean, you've mentioned uh, uh, several different dimensions uh, that we could, that all merit uh, different discussions and parallel discussions, but uh, uh, in terms of the election outcome, do you think, uh, if you could just uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, the election results and this sort of landslide victory for the New Democracy Party, does it reveal the strength of the party and, and, and Mitsotakis or the weakness and fragmentation of the opposition in your point of view? What does it say also about the opposition? And then afterwards, we will uh, give the floor to Eleni. Thank you. I think if you look at things objectively, um, it is um, obviously it's shown a strength of uh, the new democracy party, but also a particular strength of the prime minister. I think that um, that there was a lot of trust or there is a lot of trust in, in his ability um, to run the country. Um, although if you look into opinion polls, a lot of Greeks would say that neither of any of the uh, of the leaders would not are not able to run the country the way it should be run. Uh, but I think in com comparison to the others, there was a strong um, support also for him um, personally. I think also that the campaign was run rather rather professional. Also the second campaign uh, after the May result. Um, then there was also what I would call the victory syndrome um, because of the result of May. Um, a lot of people uh, also expressed support uh, for them in the second round, whereas um, others, and this is where the opposition comes in, uh, especially the main opposition party series, they had a problem in motivating their fact, uh, their their voters. Um, so I think that it has also to do with the uh, with the um, with the fact that on the opposition side, and um, there was no credible narrative. Uh, I think that they also were portraying the situation in the country more negative than it, than many Greeks feel that it is. Um, whereas the uh, the new democracy and its leader were able to have uh, a forward uh, looking um, uh, campaign saying what they want to do, having a clear idea of that, how they want to progress, saying that we need on the one hand stability, but on the other hand, that more reforms will be needed. And I think that that was something which a lot of voters uh, were ready to buy into that argument. Um, and the opposition, uh, which again was not only Syriza, but we, I think we're going to dig deeper in, in, in the upcoming uh, 50 minutes ahead of us, um, I think committed a number of mistakes and was not able to, um, to attract uh, that many voters. But again, a lot of people wanted to have stability. 
Thank you, Yanis. Indeed, stability and a very clear message. Uh, and Eleni, do you agree with this assessment? And also, what in your, what in your point, point of view are the, are the, or the key, or the key factors, factors driving, driving the election, the election uh, results. results? I agree in all of the points that Yanis made are very similar to the points I wanted to make. I think uh, that Mitsotakis is now Greece's singular and dominant political figure. He's in full control of his own party. He's in full control of his parliament and has a very wide window of opportunity to do reforms. During the previous tenure, the four years he had, he, was, um, he had a series of crises that he had to deal with from COVID uh, to the war in Ukraine with the energy crisis, the inflation crisis which really did not give him the, the time and the space to do the reforms that he had promised to do. Um, he's running with a, he ran with a reformist agenda. Uh, as Yanis mentioned, he has promised reforms in the health sector, sector justice. Greece has one of the slowest justice systems in the world uh, in education. So there are lots of expectations from him. And now he really doesn't have any excuse of not moving forward with them. Um, what was um, I think that Greece uh, is moving because of because of the um, of the opposition being in a way in a disarray. You have Syriza, which is the main opposition party, losing significantly uh, more than one third of their voters, and something. Uh, this time happened that hasn't happened in, in Greek uh, um, modern history before, that the, the, the party in power got more votes and the party in opposition lost votes. So it's like a, a, a double, double, um, um, double factors that did not, had not happened in the past. And I think that Greece for the first time in decades appears to shifting to an electoral system that resembles more the dominant party paradigm in the, in the, in the sense that the that new democracy and Mitsotakis will likely uh, likely you never know in politics, but they're likely um, going to enjoy a prolonged period of political dominance against his political opponents, as it seems now. Um, the opposition has a picture which is become becomes apparent of a fragmented center left opposition. You have on one hand Syriza and on the other hand Pasok, which is a center left party, which none of them can claim the exclusive proponents of the center left electorate. So um, I think this is not very dissimilar in the situation that prevailed in Germany at the height of Mrs. Merkel uh, political dominance during which the center-left support was split between three parties, the Social Democrats, the Linke, the Greens. So I think that's where Greece is heading now. Um, another point which also Yanis mentioned, I think is the very low levels of participation, especially in these elections, which are now comparable to Eastern European countries where voter apathy has been endemic, I think, since the collapse of communism. Um, for Greece, this is not very common to have such low voter participation. It has been building up during the crisis years, the economic crisis years. Um, but I think uh, this, is, this was a pretty low uh, rate of voter per, uh, participation, which I think demonstrates widespread levels of resentment in the country and also makes political forecasts harder um, given the volatility of, of uh, support for smaller parties. And uh, I think uh, we should also mention the smaller parties, which were the surprise element in these elections. Um, as Yanis mentioned, we had one in three voters having lent support to fringe political parties, either far left or far right of the political spectrum. And um, this may differentiate from other European countries where anti-systemic and, and anti-democratic parties have developed governing ambitions as Le Pen in France or even Orban in Hungary. Uh, however, it points again to what we just mentioned that there are significant levels of resentment within the country that Mitsotakis will definitely have to address. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. I think we're gonna go into detail afterward. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I was also, uh, thank you very much, Eleni. I was also wondering if um, you could also comment on these concurrent scandals and also tragic events and to the extent to which these events have really affected, on the one hand, the electoral campaign, but also uh, uh, the voters' uh, choices uh, in a way. Has, uh, has Have these events in any way impacted 
uh, in your view, uh, the election results or, uh, I mean, you would think you would that, think that uh, uh, you would think you would things think would expose the government and the prime minister's alleged involvement in, for example, the wiretapping wire scandal, or that it would expose its uh, inability to tackle the very reasons that lie at the root of these disasters, both uh, the train disaster and the migrant ship disaster. So I was wondering if you could also uh, say a few words about that. Thank you. I can say that, um, especially on the case of the wiretapping scandal, it did not become a public discussion about it. Uh, people did not get influenced uh, on the exposure of the scandal. Uh, there was a cynicism. I mean, you would talk to people, uh, my friends or people I knew, you would talk about the scandal and people, the reaction would be like, everybody does it, it's not a new thing, other governments have done it. It was not shocking, which is kind of, what is shocking is the cynicism actually of Greek people on, on the matter. Um, it was not something that really affected uh, their way of life, and that's always a, a very important factor. Um, events such as high inflation was the number one issue that you would ask people in the street, and that's what really, really hurt them, how hard it was and how expensive it was to make it through uh, the month. So I think, I mean, it showed also in polls after the scandal broke and, and, and the following months, it was very low in the agenda. Nobody really discussed about it or cared about it. On the other hand, when the train crash happened in uh, the beginning of March, which ended, um, which uh, had as a result the, the death of 57 people, especially young people, students who were traveling from Athens to Thessaloniki after a long weekend. Um, that created a, a lot of rage. A lot of rage, you saw mass demonstrations in most cities of, of Greece, young people out in the streets. But for some reason, they did not really pinpoint, of course the government got most of the hit from the accident, but for they, they, the people put it in a, in a, they said that it was not just new democracy's fault, it's, it's a systemic failure that has happened and other governments as well had, um, had their, their take on it. And uh, also it was interesting if one would follow the polls after the, the, um, the crash, a new democracy, the governing party lost, was losing like five points or something. But as the, the, the rage and the anger was uh, diminishing, uh, you had a return of their numbers before the accident. So, and I mean, it was, uh, it's apparent also from the electoral results. I mean, it's, it's rare to see a governing party after four years with the scandals we mentioned and the crisis we mentioned also, to increase the results instead of reducing them. I mean, it's, it's not a similar, it's not a common thing. Yanis will know better what has happened in other places in Europe, but it, it was kind of, kind of um, uh, a surprise. It came as a surprise. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, yes, just, please, Yanis, you would like to sure. respond. Yes. If I just add a couple of points, because I agree with what um, Eleni was saying, but on, you know, on the one hand, when and these are on, on both cases from the outside, um, there was an impression that these were issues which were of fundamental relevance in May and the June elections. Um, and with respect to the wiretapping scandal, where Eleni was already referring to the cynicism, a lot of people will tell you, you know, yes, this is, you know, we've seen this in the past, it's nothing new. And actually, we have other concerns which are bigger. And then the wiretapping scandal. We have things which relate to the economy, which relate to our personal perspectives, um, what will happen in future. We do not want to re-enter crisis mode as the country went through, let's not forget, went through multi-years of crisis, lost a quarter of its economy. And so people wanted to avoid this. They wanted to leave that behind. And I think that was the main concern which they had. Um, and the second was explained to the tragic train accident and train crash. And Eleni was describing that there was this strong um, anger uh, as in the first reaction to uh, to what had happened. Uh, but again, there was this feeling that, you know, uh, the railway system is one of the areas in Greece where people were aware that the levels of corruption had always been very high. Um, and when you were talking to politicians, uh, non-Greek politicians, 
um, about uh, the the, uh, the the consequences of the train crash. A lot of them would be telling them would be telling you, for for a government that is in power, if this kind of a of a tragedy happens, it is a strong blow and it's extremely difficult to recover. So contrary to what you see in other countries, in the Greek case, in the case of the train crash, um, you could see that the yeah, bureaucracy lost, as Eleni was saying, but they were able to gradually not only recover, but overcome the issue um, because other things, again, were higher on the agenda, which seemed from the outside uh, on both cases um, as if it's a surprise. But um, um, having looked into Greek politics for a while, and Eleni longer than me, um, Greek politics often is uh, is full of surprises. If you see it from the outside and you compare it uh, to how things um, are happening and, and, and are working politically in other countries, especially in, in Northern Europe uh, and Central Western Europe. Um, so I think we need to understand that uh, it is something which uh, from the outside it has been seen in a certain way, but actually, if you analyze it from a Greek internal perspective, you can really um, make sense of why actually both these issues were not high on the agenda. Uh, so picking up on that uh, uh, and, and, and what you've mentioned that these issues were not high on the agenda and the economy and the inflation and the cost of living crisis really played a big role and also considering all the indicators of the, uh, the high performance of the Greek economy. Uh, but all critics also say that this economy is heavily reliant on the tourism sector and the real estate investments. And, 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 and my question to you both is, uh, can we really uh, build sustainable economic growth on such shaky foundations? And uh, what do you think are the plans of the second Mitsotakis government to address those issues as well uh, for a second term? I can I can start if you want. Um, what makes Greece a different case, and we should not forget it, is that Greece went through a 10 year crisis. It's a really, really long period to have an economic crisis where your income, everyone's income was reduced about a quarter. That's a huge shock. So um, starting from a very low base of the Greek economy, that's why you saw Greece being one of the uh, fastest growing economies in the Eurozone after COVID. Of course, the moment uh, Greece came out of the crisis, COVID hit. So it was multiple crises and then inflation and then the war in Ukraine came and then inflation came. So um, Greece started from a low point in its economy. That's why, as I said, it, it's running with much higher rates of growth. Uh, of course, tourism is a, is a large part of its economy. About 20% of its economy is based on tourism and related to tourism uh, industries, but um, we should not uh, uh, minimize the, the achievement that Greece has really, I don't have the exact numbers, but has really uh, increased its exports in the past four years. Uh, I think um, more than 40, 50% the uh, exports have increased. Um, its debt has been reduced. Still it's one, it's the highest in the Eurozone, but the debt has been, reduced uh, due to high inflation. One of the good things of having high inflation is that your debt is gonna be reduced. Um, unemployment has been reduced. Um, so the things seem to be going in the right direction in macro levels. Of course, still levels of poverty are really high in Greece. Uh, Greece is one of the, has the highest level of poverty upper Bulgaria also one of the highest uh, rates on housing expenditure, more than 40% of one's income goes to ha housing, which is extremely high compared to other European uh, countries, which are, are around 15 to 20%, so it's about double. Um, uh, salaries are still, uh, haven't reached pre-crisis levels, so still there have been some raises in minimum salary, but they have not reached the point they were before crisis. Maybe also some economists would say maybe the salaries were too high. That's why Greece ended up in a crisis. So maybe I don't know if that's, you know, it's it's a it's a um, good way of measuring things. But um, the main issue, if you come here, uh, Marta, and you talk to people around people in the street, will be that salaries are too low compared to the expenses that they have to pay. And I think the government knows really well that this is a main issue. 
and they want to boost other areas of the economy and also try to increase um, wages. Of course, it's not a government decision, but the more growth is, is increasing, the more uh, wages could increase. During the tenure of this government, you saw investments that were not really seen in Greece before, as Microsoft, as Pfizer, uh, big companies that are investing in Greece, but still these are very small compared to what is needed. It's like small sprouts that are that are are growing, but you know it's not a clear direction, as you said. You we are heavily relying in service and tourism which is something very volatile. So I think the government needs to take that into account and invest in other areas of industry. Thank you, Yanis, Pete. Yeah, I think I think Eleni is, is highlighting exactly the right aspects. One, that obviously the country comes from a strong blow to its economy, which still needs to recover and is still in the recovery process. Uh, so the fact that you have higher growth rates also compared to others, is strongly linked to that factor. Um, but it is a valid question to ask of how sustainable uh, economic development can be in the country. Um, and I think that there is an awareness uh, of those who are who are in charge, uh, and it's not only the government, uh, of uh, what needs to be done at the national level in order to make things more sustainable. Uh, if I just mentioned a couple of things, um, the absorption capacity with respect to next, next generation EU funding, where Greece has a very high absorption capacity compared to others, um, needs to remain high. Uh, investment um, need to continue to flow into the country, as Eleni was saying. Um, there is strong investments going into certain areas. You mentioned them, Mark of tourism, real estate, they are, they are experiencing a high growth rate. There's money also from uh, uh, external investment coming into Greece, um, but that needs to continue. Um, the, 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 the need for the country to have a surplus in order to further reduce its debt, where uh, Lenny was describing it, the trajectory uh, is going in the, in, the, in the positive, in a very positive direction, uh, but that needs to continue. So it, it is a longer term effort to reach the levels which the country needs to um, reach in order to sustainably uh, have the trust also of external investors into the country. Um, the investment grading, by the way, is something which is important and the prospects are that it will improve. That's what at least we're hearing from financial institutions uh, in the upcoming period. Um, and last but not least, I think it is important, and I come back to something I said in the beginning, um, that the country will be able to convincingly show to its own people, but also to the outside, that it is ready to reform key areas, key sectors, uh, whether that is health, whether that, whether that is education, and especially the, the, the judicial system. If you look into the composition of uh, the new government, you can see that there is an emphasis, uh, at least on health and education. Um, we'll see how I'm, and I'm putting a question mark behind this, how much the country is ready to actually substantially structurally reform the judicial system, which is lagging behind. But if it tries to tackle these deep-rooted reforms which are necessary, I think that there is a chance for sustainable growth in the country, which, by the way, needs to be used in order to, and I want to emphasize something Eleni you said earlier, to help those actually who need most help. Because there are still a lot of Greeks um, who, have, who still uh, uh, suffer from the long-term effects of the crisis. Who's, who, who, if you talk to them, will tell you, we do not know how to cover our costs. Um, so they are under substantial um, uh, uh, personal economic threat. Um, and that also numbers are showing that. Um, so there is a need to help those who need most help, um, which means that you need a sustainable economic development over a longer period of time. And that's, by the way, where most Greeks, even if they're not traditional supporters of the conservatives, um, or even of, of Mitsotakis himself, trusted that this government will be able to deliver more um, than the opposition would be able to deliver. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you, Yanis. Before I, before I uh, Eleni, you, you would like to respond as well? Please, please, uh, I ahead. just want to add a, a comment to what Yanni said, uh, that the opposition did not manage to convince that they would be good in crisis management. The opposition had been scarred uh, by the first six months of 2015, where Greece was flirting with uh, exit from the euro. They were very dramatic times. I don't know, Marta, if you were in Brussels at that time, but it was like 
very, very dramatic. Um, uh, although we had Brexit afterwards, Brexit was one of the most uh, intense periods, especially this six months where Syriza and Alexis Tsipras took over the country. And I think he never, as a leader of the party, managed to take off him this image of a guy who is not dealing well with crisis. Although he did some significant moves uh, during his tenure, I mean, he did a deal with uh, North Macedonia, that was a, an issue that was uh, plaguing uh, Greece's foreign policy for many years, and other, and managed to finish a program, uh, the, the reform program, the third reform program that Greece had signed. But still, I think, uh, as Yanis said, people need stability at this moment. Greece, uh, compared to other, uh, other European countries, had been through a crisis mode for a very, very long time, and they chose the guy who they felt was stable and he could deal well during a crisis and he proved that during the COVID crisis and the energy crisis so maybe they he's not maybe they they weren't did not find inspiration in him or a great uh, feel that everything's going to be better but they felt I think and that happened showed in the vote that this guy is is a stable guy that could take us through a potential future crisis thank you thank you Maybe, I, just, yeah. maybe just to add to that, uh, sorry, Martha, but um, um, I think, and I should, we, I should have mentioned that earlier, if you look into the long-term uh, stability and development of the country, I think it will also be politically be important that uh, the center-left, uh, to put it in, in, in very simple terms, will get its act together. But you, if, because if you follow the, um, the election campaigns, um, you often had the feeling that uh, there was a strong confrontation between Syriza and Pasok. Uh, Pasok um, uh, believing that they could profit from the weakness of Syriza, recover from, uh, from, from what they have experienced over the ten, past 10 years, um, rather than concentrating on being an opposition party to those in government. Um, and I think that that's something which, uh, if you look into the uh, longer term political perspective, is important that on the in the center left there will be a development which will actually enable the center left to be able to to come up with a credible alternative in terms of a proactive program of what they want to do. And I think a lot of people do not trust um, in the center left to have that uh, credible alternative program um, in their minds, uh, in their plates, in their drawers. Um, which you would require to take over the, the government. Um, so that is something which uh, obviously uh, you will have to see that that is something which is strengthened in the Greek political system. Um, and as I said before, the question is also how the, how one will deal with the right wing, the 13, 1, 3 uh, percent of, of, of right wing extreme radical parties and um, how they will do in future. Uh, um, we have the Spartans, the Greek solution, the victory, um, who have done rather well. The Spartans were not even on the agenda in May. Um, so we see that the right wing parties are doing well. So there's also a question of how to how to deal with that. Interesting enough, as a side remark, uh, especially as we have a lot of people from the so-called Brussels crowd, it's interesting to mention that uh, that Yanis Varoufakis, mayor of 25, did not make it into the government. And make it sorry, make it into the parliament. Um, they were the, he was he was portraying himself as being the anti-systemic, who's actually the only one talking truth to power. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, he did not manage also in the second election round in June um, to enter parliament because he was not able to get over the the three percent threshold. Um, so, which is an interesting. Um, thing to mention because I sometimes still feel from the outside that there are a lot who believe that uh, Yanis Varoufakis still plays a role, can play a role in the country, has a certain strength, has a certain credibility. I think that the election result is showing that all this is not the case. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, I actually have a couple of follow-up questions, but I won't raise them now. Uh, I'm actually especially interested in hearing more of your thoughts on the on on this sort of uh, uh, apparent growing trend of the far right, and whether or not you are concerned about this. But before 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 we go ahead and have uh, and 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 discuss the rise of the far right, I would like to bring in some audience questions as well, so that we ensure that they have enough time to also address our speakers with their questions. Uh, I see uh, two written questions. I don't know if anyone also wants to take the floor. And uh, if so, please, please do that. Um, but uh, we do have one person wants to raise the uh, raise a question in 
directly to you. So I will I will uh, give the floor. Um, or Tatiana, if you can give the floor to Berta. Hi. Yes, please. Yeah, hello. So I'm Berta for the EPC as well. Um, I wanted to like first ask about the, ra the rise of the far right. So, but if you're gonna, gonna speak about that later, I'm just gonna put my second question, which is about the relations between uh, Athens and Ankara. So how the formation of the government will like whether how it will affect on on the relationship uh, between the two countries in Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. And I take the opportunity to also uh, maybe raise a few questions from the audience in written form because they are related to uh, this question of uh, Greek-Turkey relations. And one is how do you assess the pressures and intimidation that were experienced by the Turkish community in Western press before and during the election insofar as the only region in Greece where Syriza was the first party uh, was the first party was the Rodopi region. Sorry, I'm not sure I, I read that correctly, but um, and then maybe afterwards I will go to the second question just so that we're not too overwhelmed with different questions. Thank you. Please, um, Eleni, you want to go? You want to go on first. or go first? I mean, uh, it's really hard to tell. Um, how relation between Athens and Ankara will unfold. Uh, before the, the earthquake um, in Turkey, the, the relationship were in an absolute lowest point in terms of uh, the rhetorics. We heard statements, especially from the Turkish side, that were really, really intense, like we would come during the night and take your islands, like really aggressive uh, statements from Erdogan himself, um, which uh, had flared up a lot of tension. Uh, again, in rhetoric, you wouldn't see, and you wouldn't see actual tension other than overflights from Turkey to the Greek uh, aerial space. Um, Greece, in the past four years, has uh, has managed to to get new military equipment uh, in its navy and in, in its air force. Um, so that is a significant um, game changer in the relationship. Um, after the earthquake, I have to say that things really changed in a sense that Greece was one of the first countries to send help in, uh, in uh, the, 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 um, the areas that were hurt. And uh, there was a, a shift in the rhetoric that was much more suave and much more uh, um, not, not intense, actually. Uh, so and now it's really it's really up in the air how Erdogan would like to to pro progress with Greece. I think that there are so many economical problems at the moment and issues in Turkey that um, creating tension with Greece might not be one of his first priorities. Also, Erdogan has been in power since I think 2002. If I'm wrong, please correct me. And although there have been many moments of great tension, there has never been an actual incident happening. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, Mitsotakis appointed as foreign minister, uh, the guy who was a uh, uh, minister of state in the previous tenure, which means that he was very close to him. He was in his office. He's not a diplomat, but he's a very trusted person. So I think the fact that he's appointing that guy means that he wants to also have control of the foreign ministry. So that's maybe a shift that foreign policy, and especially with Turkey, will be something that he will be dealing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry I cannot be more specific, but I really don't know what will happen between the two countries. <laughs> it's always so unpredictable, but Jans might have a, great, a better opinion. You're muted, Yanis. Sorry for that. Um, but I think the way Eleni you were describing the situation is very valid. Um, and there are question marks um, because yes, you now see that on both sides, there's a readiness to engage with each other. Um, there are signals being sent in terms of trying to find, uh, um, uh, to, to make, to improve qualitatively the relationship. 
um, but there still are a lot of question marks. And if you um, talk to people on both sides, there's a the question of, you know, how actually sustainable is a rapprochement between Athens and Ankara? Will at some moment in time, if you actually have to tackle some of the thorny issues between both sides, would you then return to the old rhetoric, um, as Eleni was saying? Would you then see a re-escalation of the situation? But yes, but, but the expectation for the time being, at least midterm, I think, uh, among many, is that what we saw before the earthquake, uh, which was uh, a situation which had negatively developed and you were probably at a low point, um, as, as Eleni was describing, that that situation uh, will not repeat itself in the foreseeable future, that we will have an improvement of the situation. The question is, how long term would it be? Um, and let's not forget, it also relates to how the developments will be um, on things which are out of control. Um, the, the, obviously, the earthquake was something which was out of control. The, the pandemic was out of control. And um, so there are also things which we cannot make a prognosis of. Um, but, I, but I hope, I personally hope that uh, the period which is now in front of us, which uh, seems to be a period where there are opportunities for cooperation, will be used in order to enhance cooperation. But how long term and that will be or not be depends on so many variables and so many factors. Um, also with respect to the future of the future everyone himself. himself. Um, so, 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 so it's so. extremely difficult to make a prognosis um, without not being uh, uh, on, on, on too thin ice. Can I add one point that we forgot to mention is that other than the military uh, intervention, of course, or uh, the rhetorics, another tool that has been uh, that Turkey has in their hands is the migration issue. There's a lot of pressure when things don't go well. There's pressure in Greek borders um, from the Turkish side of of uh, migrants moving to Greece. That's what the Greek government at least says that they are instrumentalizing the migration issue to put pressure on Greece. And you see flares of, uh, of migrants, especially on the land border that Greece has with Turkey. And there was a very big incident back in 2020 where there were thousands of people at the border trying to get in from Turkey to Greece. And then for the first time you saw uh, um, United from the from the from Brussels from Europe actually von der Leyen went there and uh, Charles Michel went there and they supported Greece saying that this is not a Greek border it's a European border so I'm just adding another element of friction of possible friction in the future and there's also the Greek the EU Turkish. Uh, um, agreement where it says that whatever illegal migrants come to Turkey who do not who are not who cannot get asylum, they should be returned to Turkey. And this has not been happening for almost years now, like at least two years. Turkey is not accepting back um, illegal migrants. So these are just issues that are out there and could create friction in the near future. Uh, just uh, thank you, Eleni and Yanis. Then to pick up on that as well, but also to bring uh, one question, another question from the audience uh, that actually makes a link with the emergence of a strong right and conservative spectrum in the Greek parliament alongside a similar right wing and nationalist majority uh, formed as a result of Turkey's twin elections in May and the re election of President Erdogan. Do you think how this sort of uh, uh, this growing trend of, uh, if we can speak of a growing trend also on the Greek side, uh, 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 towards a more conservative nationalistic far right um, movement on both sides, how it can affect the dyna dynamics of the Turkey bilateral relationship as well. Um, th this is one, one, one question uh, from, from our audience. Uh, Yanis, do you want to go first? Sure, no problem. Um, obviously, it has an effect. Um, if you have uh, parties who clearly have a, a strong right-wing extremist nationalist position that uh, entering um, strongly rather into the parliament, um, then that has an effect, obviously, on what the overall de de debate looks like. Having said that, I think uh, we've already experienced uh, similar things in when it comes to foreign policy um, issues in Greece in the past. 
Um, and what we've seen up to now is that uh, the government, that the government of Mitsotakis has, has tried to, uh, as much as possible, um, uh, tried to uh, find a way of, on the one hand, reflecting the pressures, but still being a rational actor trying to avoid um, a situation where there is an escalation. Because as uh, Eleni was saying, we have an escalation of rhetoric, but we don't have an escalation of actions. Um, and that is important, obviously. Um, so my expectation would be, yes, there is pressure. But by the way, that pressure also coming, uh, for, for example, from within a new democracy, where you have also different fractions in terms of um, who is uh, more of a, someone who uh, you know, reflecting and 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 underlining the national interest. That is also some some th these are elements which come also from the traditional mainstream parties. Um, uh, but we've seen up to now that uh, an escalation of a nationalist position, at least on the Greek side, has not happened. So I wouldn't expect it, even though you have now the entrance of far right uh, uh, parties into the new uh, new parliament, uh, probably stronger than some had expected some months ago. Uh, but let's not forget also um, that uh, this is also an outcome or an, or an uh, result of the low turnout. Uh, you've had 53%, roughly 53% turnout in, in June, you had 61% turnout in May. And we know that traditionally, um, whether it's right extremes or left extreme parties, that they're able to mobilize their voters much more than traditional parties. Um, so if you would have had a similar uh, turnout than you've had than what you had um, in May, 60 plus percent, um, also the likelihood of these parties not being as strong as they now are um, would have been high. So let's not forget that. That doesn't mean that one should undermine um, uh, the, the problematic coming from the fact that you have uh, these three um, very right wing or radical parties and entering parliament is not something which is worrisome. Uh, but on the other hand, we also need to be, um, uh, be also put things into a certain perspective. Thank you. Thank you. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna come in? No, I think I couldn't agree more with what Yanni said. Uh, I think that fringe parties will uh, not only on the on the matter of Turkey, but will pose a threat and will pose also disruption in parliament for a series of issues uh, like migration, Turkey for sure. Uh, so I think it will create a big headache. The least I can say to Mitsotakis as he's usually perceived more vulnerable to far-right attacks, as he also has elements which are closer to far-right in his own party. Um, so he always has to be very balanced on how he deals with them because it's usually perceived that voters from that go to the far right are usually from his party that have gone there. Not not you, not always, but some are. So that's why Mitsotakis will have a hard time to pass legislation in, in many issues when you have all these fringe parties that will now have a platform, which is a parliament to bro bro broadcast their populist messages and uh, bring toxicity in uh, in the discussion. But I think, but I think the, point the, the, point, the point you mentioned, point earlier, you mentioned earlier, earlier, Lenny, when it comes when to, it comes to policy, foreign... international relations, the fact that he has uh, put someone in place with respect to the foreign ministry, which is someone who is very close to him, is a very strong signal that this is something where he has certain worries and he wants to make sure that he has um, a certain level of control on how things develop. So that was a very strong point which Eleni made, and I think we need to have that in mind because it gives also a signal with respect to what um, uh, what is uh, what his ambition is, which I think is to keep the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean in the relationship with Turkey as stable as possible, because obviously this has an effect on so many other policy issues. Uh, Elena was mentioning migration, but also what we were mentioning earlier, uh, if there's a, de a fundamental deterioration between Greece and Turkey, that is also detrimental to the economic perspectives. It's not uh, it's not a, a sine qua non qua, uh, issue, but it is something which has a negative effect. So I think he's, th th there is a strong sensitivity for how significant uh, um, this portfolio area is and, to and that he wants to make sure that things don't uh, move in the wrong direction. Thank you both. I will like to give the floor to one person also from the audience who's who raised his hand. Uh, please introduce yourself and, and, and please uh, raise your question. You have the floor.
Not sure what's going on. Uh, we can't hear you, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, while we, uh, okay, now you're muted. Uh, we're giving it another try and then if not, I'll, uh, maybe you can raise your question in writing in the Q&A uh, box. Maybe it's better and then I read it out loud. And in the meantime, I will ask another question <laughs> to our panelists. Um, okay. And so, yes, this was actually my, my final <laughs> question to both of you uh, regarding, and, and, and I'm changing subjects now a little bit, but uh, regarding the rumors that have been uh, going on around, I, I, I assume both in Brussels and Athens, that Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis might be interested in one of the top EU jobs uh, from 2024 onwards. Uh, now, I think, of course, uh, it may be a little premature to have this conversation right now, as it depends on several variables, and we don't have yet the full picture at this point. But uh, I wonder what your you know, how do you assess these rumors, both from Athens and Brussels, and uh, and, uh, and and you think that Mitsotakis' landslide victory could affect this possibility? Um, I don't know who was the last, I don't remember who was the last person to speak, but then maybe Elena, Eleni, I'll give you the floor now. now. I think uh, since elections are gonna be next year, I don't think Mitsotakis is gonna be a candidate at the moment for the immediate uh, elections as he just won his own elections. I think I, I've asked him this question before during an interview. He has denied it, but you could tell that, you know, he couldn't. It's one of these issues that when you ask politicians, they can never really say about it. Um, the fact, though, that his party, New Democracy, is now one of, if not the strongest, but one of the strongest in the EPP family, uh, he came out as Second, he won actually two two elections in a row with a great percentage, a landslide victory. Um, four more years, I think, uh, could place him as a strong candidate for any top job. Um, I wouldn't have said that before the elections because I would think that the my the um, wiretapping scandal and the hard uh, migration policies would be big obstacle for him. Um, now, though, that he won again the elections, I don't know if they will be issues that will be brought forward in case he goes for a top European job. I think Yanis will know better on the issue in terms of how he would uh, be perceived in Brussels. <laughs> but I think it's something in his mind, uh, but most probably for the next tenure, not the one coming up, I mean. Or, or, uh, uh, Yanis, uh, what's what's your sense on this? Well, first of all, it's always difficult to to deal with rumors, but these rumors have existed. Um, and Eleni posed the question to him not because she had not heard of these rumors, um, but um, uh, putting jokes aside. On the one hand, I think he's someone, and you hear that also from within the European Council, he's someone who is well respected uh, from his peers. He's someone who is being listened to, who is being is seen as being a credible um, a partner within the European Council. And that is, you don't only hear from conservative circles, it's also from others who believe that he is a, a strong, credible actor within the European Council. And he also has the ear um, of leading um, politicians at um, the European level. Um, second, the fact that, as Eleni was describing, there were two victories with 40 plus percent after having been four years in power, if you see that from a perspective of any elected politician, whether he's on the left or one is the right, it's being seen as a major accomplishment. So that obviously um, uh, strengthens him. Um, but on the other side, um, I think that even he would have not have expected, I think, in May to have the result he had. Um, I think that the, the calculation was that they would have a good result in May, and that there would be a polarization in June, and that with the new, with the with the bonus, uh, they would then be able to get a majority in government. Um, so I think he himself, I think, um, 
who did not only pretend that we surprised that he was surprised on the election night in May. I think he actually himself was surprised about the, the result, um, which means that I think he feels himself in a very comfortable position now. He's in a very strong position. No one in New Democracy can doubt that this um, this, this election result. Uh, has a has not to do with him. It has a lot to do also with him personally. So I think he's in a very strong leadership position. Now we do not know what happens within a year's time because uh, when we talk about the new EU leadership configuration, we're talking about this being decided in June, July, August. Let's see how long it will take of next year. Um, so there's still a long way to go from now to then. Um, but if if I would put myself into his shoes, and, um, I'm daring to do so now, I would consider that I have a strong position at home. Uh, is this now the right moment to uh, to to uh, to move on to um, to to Brussels? Um, we've seen that happening in the past. Uh, that uh, when 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 the EU calls, there's the argument: uh, How can a national po um, politician refuse, especially when? She comes from a smaller country, and so let's. Uh, it's difficult to make a prognosis. Having said that, if you look into the bigger picture of things, uh, if actually, and there seem to be indication that the chances of Ursula von der Leyen getting an, another five years have increased over the past months, um, if that trend upholds until next year, and if she actually has a chance to become a commission president, she is a conservative, um, then others will be calling for the other top job. And now there are more, there are many top jobs. It's not only two, but I think there are two major top jobs, presidency of the European Commission, presidency of the European Council. If the presidency of the European Commission goes to the uh, goes to the Conservatives, assuming that would be the, the scenario, I would not assume that, uh, that another Conservative would become president of the European Council. Um, and uh, if that arithmetic of the past proves to be again correct, next time, and I think it will uh, prove correct um, next time, the chances of him becoming one of the two presidents, uh, or in this case, the president of the European Council, would be rather slim. Um, so if I combine these two things with each other, my guess now, or if you would force me to bet, would be that he will probably not um, uh, take up one of these leadership positions. But again, a lot of things can happen both in Brussels, in Athens, and wherever from now until next June, July. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if Felin, you want to add anything or uh, or uh, also, or also yeah. please, please, no, please, I'm, please. I'm fully covered by Yanis. <laughs> and also, I don't know if uh, we have just one more minute, but uh, if uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, I think Shara Lampos is your name, if you want to try to raise your question again, uh, you have one last opportunity. So uh, please, uh, Please raise your question if you'd like to now. Okay, let's give it another try. No, we still don't hear you. Okay. No. no. Doesn't work. Uh, I'm sorry that it didn't work, uh, but uh, I think this was a very, very, very interesting 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 discussion, discussion of, of uh, very uh, useful insights um multiple repercussions to 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 monitor in the in the coming years and now in the next mandate um i'm very very grateful for your insights and your participation in this discussion today and uh, many thanks also to our audience for staying with us we will of course continue to closely monitor elections uh, taking place across europe so uh, stay tuned to our future initiatives and also to our future election monitors. And, and we look forward, look forward to welcoming forward. you to our uh, future events. And thank you so much and have a very good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Marta. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.